Then I'm talking about how to push the women's webinar. So if you're in the wrong place, I'll follow you for going to the other big sessions that are happening right now. Um, Real quick, this is a, a more of a thing at DevCon and the European CLA Summit, but um, I thought I'd chip into this effort that Fabiola started. Um, we have a couple of really awesome ladies who work at NI who I get to work with. And I just wanted to lift up. Um, sometimes it's not some female back in history, you did something and you created some people right around you. And um, I think I'm really lucky to work with these people. You've seen Deb Burke around. Um, She's my boss, actually. She's awesome. Um, you can congratulate her on baby number two. You want to? That's what she does. Um, Christina Rogers is a product manager that I work with. I team very work with a lot. She's awesome. She's not here at the CLA Summit, but um, this is all you. And I work with a bunch of other ladies at and I who I'm really lucky to get to work with. Uh, we don't have um, near 50% representation at a high, but that's okay. I'm still happy to be working with these guys, uh, including our VP of the um, VP group I'm in. So I'm Rita Breaker. I'm on the software product management team, and Darren Gillis is here with me. He's um, a product owner in R&D. We work really closely together and drive the roadmap for the web launch. Um, I'd like to get started with this just to make sure that we're all grounded in what we are doing with the web module. And it's really to solve this problem. We're in the, the modern world, everything's distributed, different people need different kinds of information, they need it now, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense to make applications for each of those individual people. And that's why a lot of a lot of people are turning to the web to solve that problem, which is great, but then you have to know how to use the web. So you have to know how to use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You have to know networking front and back. You have to know how to post an application somewhere. You have to know about security. So it's not just a simple, oh, I'm going to use web technology now. Um, so that's why we created the web module in the first place. Um, so you may have heard the web module. It's used at show of hands. Who's heard of this by now? Hopefully everyone. Has anybody used it yet? Show hands, less people. Yeah, it's about the similar um, response as the European CLA Um So not quite in the hands of everybody yet. But um, quick question: is, yeah. is the web module like the client side stuff or the server, the browser. server side stuff? What's it called? It is on the browser side. It runs browser side. Okay, so it's like HTML VI, VI is pretty much. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, big difference from this is our NI's previous. Attempts at web technology is you don't have to install a runtime or any kind of plugin into the browser when you use this. It's just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript under the hood. So with, once you deploy it, all your end users just interact with it like a web page. So that's a big difference. Um, I also like to ground us in what you can do with web BIs today. What I've seen people already start doing with web BIs today. Um, these are just a couple of areas, but of course there's more. Um, but the first would be remote monitoring. Um, so it could be as simple as just monitoring the temperature of a test or an experiment. Um, our, our very first purchaser of the web module was doing something like this. Um, like he was just running a long running test that was far away from the desk. He wanted to see how it was going. And so he was simply just monitoring that in the web guy. Also, do remote control. It's not just one way, you can go both ways. So this is an example of us. Uh, starting a test remotely. We showed this at NI Week last year, maybe the year before, um, where we had a PXI system running here, and then down at the convention center, we were starting tests and showing the results back. There's also uh, a bit of use of web APIs in data entry. And G-Systems is one of the people who um, pioneered using web APIs for this reason. They just needed a common form that technicians could pull up in a browser and enter data from their test error. And they have a pretty sweet blog about that on their website. And then lastly, say you have data that you recorded and you're just trying to look back through it and explore it a little bit. It doesn't have to be live data. You can also explore back to uh, previously acquired data. <coughs> So the three components that I always talk about when uh, talking about the web module are 
web BIs, which that's kind of the buzzword that everybody hears about. But there's also data services that come with the web module and the, the actual NI web server. And how these all laid out are just like this. So kind of like the question before, web BIs run in a browser, runs on any device that can run a browser. So that's a lot of things these days. Um, it talks to a web server, which actually hosts the, the web page files. Um, and when we say server, that just means any network. And then lastly, uh, data services go between whatever devices you're running. So that could be Compact Rio, could be a desktop PC, whatever. The data services run between that and your web API. And kind of like I mentioned this morning, those uh, those data services can talk to LabVIEW, they can talk to LabVIEW next sheet, or they can talk to third party web services. So, um, Again, you don't have to port everything over to NXG to start using this. You can leave your Compact Rio running uh, by you today and just attach it with you. And then under the hood, this is definitely not something you're required to understand in order to use the web module, because it is just LabVIEW. Um, but in case you're curious, what's going on under the hood is we're taking the front panel and compiling that into HTML and CSS, which you can actually look at and explore and modify. Um, and with your block diagram, we are compiling that down into uh, BI assembly, which is our text language that runs in the browser using our JavaScript engine called Virio, which is also available for you. Yeah. So I um, showed a little bit of this this morning, but I'll go into more depth this time. It's just a simple application, simple BI that I built to show how all the pieces come together. So again, this is just LabVIEW. You. you have your project. If you haven't seen NXG yet, um, the project team is on the side now. Um, it has normal things you would expect for a front panel. You still have your block diagram, normal concepts that you would expect on a block diagram. Some palettes in there. It's not identical to all the palettes that are available on a regular BI, but there's quite a bit of stuff there. And then you can get to the HTML source by clicking that button. Oh. So a new thing that we added was flexible layout. So over here in the panel, I'm going to change from absolute layout to flexible. And now when I drop these down, you'll see some highlighted bars that show you kind of how the layout should act. So have my chart. I'm going to drop down the numeric indicator to decide where to put that. I'm going to fit in its own box, resize it a little bit. There's a ton of different customizations you can do with this, um, especially now that we've had, we're, we're about to not four um, But you can change it to where you don't have your controls resized as your um, EI panel resizes. You can uh, change the minimum size of one of those controls in our uh, Fora release. But what this means is when I run it in the browser, it loads. Um, whenever I resize the window, so I change from desktop to mobile device, it will wrap around the form. I didn't have to do a lot of crazy um, programmatic property manipulation. It was just all configured. So that's a simple example, but gives you a taste of what you can do. Um, now to make that web BI actually useful, we have to get data into it. This is the same table that I showed this morning. There's a ton of different data services you can choose from. We've got the system link APIs. Um, those come with the LabVIEW Nishi web module. Uh, we have LabVIEW web services, so if you're using those today, you can use those in conjunction with our HTTP client API on the web BI side. Um, we just added WebSocket support, so if you're using WebSockets in your Lab application today, you can connect those up with the WebSocket client API and web BI, and then one of the, the opportunities are endless with uh, the JavaScript library interface, which they are not talk about anymore. But all that to say, you can and should use Lab and Lab Manage together, and this is how it happens. So when would you use which API? This is kind of how I broke down the pros and cons between all of these. Um, I think system API is a good user-friendly 
things that we use is the open and very closed format that we're used to integrated with our web server, system web server, system <coughs> cloud. Um, it doesn't support streams or files yet. We are changing the story on files in our next release, but um, that is a current downside. Um, yeah. Is there an easy way to install the system link APIs to a older version of LabVIEW, like LabVIEW 2015, that is in a different machine than your NXG? Because, like, I've got 2015 in one VM, I've got 2019 with NXG in a different VM. If I want the system link APIs, how do I get them into that 2015 That's a good VM? Question. Um, so the way I know it works today is when you install the web module, it will see if you already have that view 2015 or whatever installed, and it'll say, hey, do you want to install the system link tag and SH API? It's a checkbox, and you're on your way. Separating them so they're not on the same machine, I'm not sure if the system link team uh, un like repackaged their APIs to be separately installable. I heard that might have been a thing at one point in time, but I'm not sure. Yeah. At one point in time, you go to meta.com and you can search for system link client API. And that would take you to a version of thing you can download that just got that. Okay. So I don't know if it's a change. I have to check. It's been about a year since I've checked on it. System link moves fast, so check. Hi. Um, <laughs> when we say files support in web APIs, what type of functionality would that be? And I, I'm thinking, uh, like I'm wondering, does that mean that like I have a, like a browse for a file button on the front panel, but as a user in the web browser, they're selecting a local file that then is accessible inside of my web VI that could potentially be uploaded and or is there local file storage within my VI that somehow gets persistent? I don't think what I might have that look like? Like my computer. Yeah. I'm going to demo all those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Maybe I missed one, then we'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. You might want to use Labby web services. Of course, if you already have them implemented, you can keep those and just call them with the HTTP client API that we have in WebVI's. Uh, there's a little bit of a niche in uh, with using lab web services and web APIs because they are um, on different web servers while you're developing your web API. Uh, so don't, web servers don't like to talk to each other if you don't give them explicit permission. So that's what we call a cores issue. Um, so that can be a little bit difficult. You know, that's coming if you can work around that. Um, and we are improving that soon. So as of the May release. Um, and then lastly, WebSockets. Again, you might already have these implemented. You should keep using those. It's a pretty user-friendly API. This one's really good for streaming, whereas the other ones might not necessarily be good for streaming. Uh, and the downsides are, uh, I mean, this may not be a downside, but we didn't develop the WebSocket toolkit for um, the lab application side. That's, I think there are a couple of different versions out in the wild. Um, but you would have to use that one, and uh, the, the one I found with Samshark at Media Modules doesn't have security implemented in it yet. Uh, he has all intentions to work on that and add security to his WebSockets API, but currently there's no encryption or anything built in. Does that mean that system link has encryption? Yes, yeah, system link APIs do have encryption. So, I think you probably remember this from this learning, but uh, you take a closer look at what I'm doing here. This is the system link API in Lab 2017. Uh, I'm actually opening a connection to uh, system link cloud, which is our cloud hosting service that you get with the web module if you're active on SSD. Um, I'm just opening a tag. Different data types are supported. And this is a VI that you would be running on a desktop or a compact reading? Or? That's correct. This would be the VI you'd run on a desktop or compact reading. All this works with compact reading. So that's Labby 2017. Then this is Labby to HTTP. Same thing. Opening a connection to the same system link cloud server with the right API key. Opening this would be a VI I would intend to run in the browser. It's a yes. new web VI, so this is running as a 
browser client BI Correct. where all the code is running in the browser? Correct. Okay. The web BI is running in the browser. I see you in the browser. So this is just showing quickly how you connect the two. So the desktop serial producer, web browser consumer, and then there's a system observer in the middle, magic. Correct. Yep. So the API supports the data and the data by a other channel someone has to transport and convert. I think so. Yeah. Probably one benchmark. Yeah. 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 Maybe you're gonna get to this later, but can you talk a little bit more about how you would add uh, Security to this, like in terms of like Yeah, um, I don't. I don't think I get into too much of the details on this. Um, I'll be back. Because um, I want to hand it off to Darren. He's going to tell you all the ways you can do crazy stuff with JavaScript and CSS with WebBIs. This is my quick primer. But essentially, the security is up to how you host it. So if you're using the NI Web server, which is the same server that you use if you're using Systemlink then um, you'd be setting usernames and passwords on there. You can do roles and uh, uh, authentication in there. Um, I think so. We probably won't help you with the thir third party implementations, but the NI web server is just an Apache web server with a like, big utility on top of it. So if you know what you're doing with web servers and how to plug into Apache, then you can go to town. Okay, so once you have everything built, this is me showing how you build it into a package to then go host it. Um, works like building packages in uh, with regular NXGBI for applications. Um, in the system link cloud case, I'm going to take this package and upload it to system link cloud, and then yeah, show you the home page for that. And once it's uploaded here, you can set different security settings on a per BI basis. Um, System Link Cloud has its own security built in, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I can share this with everyone, certain people, or just keep it private to me. Uh, whatever you want. And then once you click on that, or you have email the link to someone, they can give you your. But this is good for mobile applications where somebody's opening it on a phone, they might not be that your company's VPN. Uh, this is a good option for that if we work with the smaller the cloud. So that was my super fast primer. I'm going to shoot through the roadmap and then Jerry can talk about some of the awesome things we do with web guys. So, again, uh, we've come a long way since our first release. We added events and properties, we knew that was a big one that we were missing. Uh, we added that pretty quick after our first release, added the JavaScript library interface, um, added cloud hosting, flexible layout, web sockets. Uh, you can customize the icon in your web BI and browser. We have one to two button dialogues, tree control, a bunch of good stuff. Split run button is new, better HTML source interactions like control F. That's something we didn't have in the beginning, we added pretty quick. And then with Foro, uh, we have uh, better support for rank waveforms, variant support, and uh, the file API that we talked about. So you are generating a file on the Wagon 2017 side, uploading it to the NI web server, and then your web API can read from that. And this is specifically for TDMS files for now. Uh, yeah, and this is just an example of how we've grown since our first release. Uh, the blue stuff is stuff we added in Brio, and the green stuff is what we added in uh, Brio 1. And then in Foro, we just added a bunch So we're, we're making big strides as we go along. Um, and then I showed this earlier, but uh, Fiva, we were really focused on unlocking the community. And a lot of what Darren's going to talk about is uh, methods and ways and ideas uh, to get you inspired for building IP with the JavaScript library interface, extending the web API in uh, cool ways with CSS, um, so that you can get the whole community involved, extending what web API is. 
quick question. Yes. So is the web module part of Pro? The web module is not part of Pro. It's not part of Pro. It's an, an add-on to it's, Pro. Yeah. It's just like our team of computers. Different targets it's added for that. But it is included with the community edition. Yeah. Okay. For sake of time, just let your but a lot of you are new to WebEI, so I'm going to apologize in advance if we're going from zero to like 120 miles per hour. It's not stopping. And uh, my goal here is really to inspire you and not to like capture every little detail, maybe of what we're doing here, and like learn JavaScript within the last 25 minutes we have here. Um, more to show you, like, you can do a lot of crazy and amazing things. And I think that the partners, probably in this room, have more capability to unlock that for normal lab EG developers than anybody. Because a lot of people don't want to learn JavaScript, but they will use the G library that uses the JavaScript library to play with so to do awesome things. I think hopefully you guys get excited about really good with us. I put a link up here to uh, uh, our NIV uh, session. We did a pretty deep dive on this. So I'm going to kind of cover that and add on some things that came in for it because that allowed you guys to keep those things. We're really going to focus on this technology called the JavaScript library interface. And this is how you can take your diagram of the eye and extend it to do new amazing things. And the reason we can do these new amazing things is because there's a lot of web developers out there churning out JavaScript and do all sorts of things with libraries. And so you can basically incorporate that into your page and, and, and use it with a lab API. And then the idea here is I'm also going to demonstrate how you can package that up and then share it on the AI package manager and, and give it to other people uh, at the store and can charge it for that, that sort of thing. Uh, what am I talking about with the JavaScript library interface? Uh, we use this JSLI term because it's way easier to say. I never remember what I stands for. So a JSLI document, this is what it looks like. It's a file in your project. Uh, it is not a diagram space. It is a place where you define how a uh, lab user would interpret the JavaScript uh, side of the house. So here, what you can do is you can have two sections here. There's a top section where we put in a uh, little blurb of HTML tags that we stick and inject inside the, uh, the web page that gets generated. This is important because often JavaScript files have a dependency order. Things must be done in a certain order. Uh, this is how you're able to define that. We'll also you include CSS. So if you're trying to build like a third-party control, you can take CSS and JavaScript files and mix them in and integrate that cleanly into your web API. And then the bottom half of this is where you tell it what the JavaScript symbol is you're trying to call and then what, what is the actual uh, function call on the parameters that's going to expect any of that. This all kind of came, up, came along in a series of a couple of releases, and we're continuing to make strides on this as we go forward. I'm going to show a little demo of that. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a library, show you how you can basically build a little thin VI wrapper on top of your JavaScript stuff. Uh, you can then, uh, we have some kind of best practices to share there, and then I'll consume the rest as a package user. So there's the steps I'm going to go through, and see if I can remember them without flashing back to the screen. Impressive. Um, so right here, I'm just going to pull over to Lazy NXG. That's going to make a brand new project, and I'm going to call it login. So it turns out there's one piece of JavaScript that's built into every browser. Uh, and you can output a log message. So that's a really easy way to demo without having to pull up a JS file and teach you what that does. You just take a string and print it to the console. So I'm going to build a library that, that does that. Uh, so here I have a, a, a GBI web. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new namespace. One of our uh, best practices here is we have a, a, a namespace called support uh, where you can call your, your web start in there without having to get worried about it, uh, hitting the inclusion and other things. So I'm going to define a new JavaScript library interface here. And here's a, one of these new documents. You can see there's a giant comment here. So if you're not familiar with HTML tags, we've given you a bunch of the ones that you're probably going to use. You can just copy paste them. Uh, if you don't need any of that stuff, like I'm not going to need today, Leave that and then tell us what, what JavaScript function I want to call. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to call console.log the function. and have my function. Uh, I will have to give it a parameter that I want to give it a string. Uh, my data types so that I can support some pretty basic ones here uh, that we support both on the JavaScript side and interpreting into lab view. Uh, in this case, we're just going to take a string and I'm going to leave it called R. That's okay. Then we're going to call my function log. This, is, this defines an API that the rest of my code will use. You can see a really awesome icon with a log in it. Um, and I can save that. Now, what does it look like when I call it? Right? Uh, let me show you how that works. Uh, so 
if I was calling this directly, I could get rid of my product items palette and bury it in here, and my support folder uh, is this log function. You drop it, and it looks just like any other node call, right? Uh, you can wire a string up to it. Uh, no problem, string in. You can uh, have error ins and outs to this guy. Uh, don't need this loop anymore. So if I uh, have this kind of OPI, you know, like this little screen thing here, let's just put the string here. Let's just run it and see kind of what happens. State everything. Now I'm just going to go say uh, run in browser. And what I get is nothing because I have no default value here. It turns out my API starts running as soon as I set open in browser. So one interesting trick you run into with web APIs is you have to go set the default value on things like this if you're trying to test it out. Test this coolness. Okay. And if I type in there, that's not good enough. I have to make it my current default value. Uh, now if I go ahead and run in the browser, uh, my string is there. So you're saying, well, that's great. Like, what happens? Uh, well, you have to kind of go look in that, uh, not there. Look in the console, which is uh, well, debugging tools, or developer tools. And here, there is there's my message. Test this coolness happened uh, at this time in this generated JavaScript file. So, OK, like, not that amazing. I made a log message. I'm not really trying to show something really cool at this point. I'm basically trying to show you how to make a library. Uh, right now, what I've done is I made an application. So we need to kind of change this out and say, how would I build a library to wrap this function and give it to other people? So uh, one way to do that, you come up here and say, file new library. That makes it a library type component. You can tell it's uh, called log lib. Uh, and I'm going to tell it that it's a web server targeted thing called log lib. OK. So it's giving me now a uh, link component. And I'm going to take that support stuff that I made. I'm going to drag it over. Oh, I'm going to make a new uh, namespace here. Let's drag that file over here. It's going to ask me if I want to move it. I say yes. I don't need it over there anymore. Uh, no problem. Uh, so now I have like a library component with that JavaScript definition in there. But I really want to have a layer of G code in between. Uh, consumers of my library and that JavaScript function. That way, if something changes on the JavaScript side, I can rev that, and no one has to be uh, changing, nothing has to change on the interface to my clients. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and make a VI. So, I'm actually going to make a regular VI instead of a web VI. Did you know that regular web VIs actually are okay on a web target? That's kind of bizarre. Something bizarre you see is that the web button doesn't work. It's grayed out, has this funny kind of visual treatment. Uh, that is because the VI doesn't run on a web target, but you can inline it into a web VI at the top level, and that will work. So uh, if you have a VI and you want to have a swing both ways, both on the web and the desktop, you can use a normal .gvi, and then you always have to call it as a sub. And that's how you can kind of do that whole trick. And if you look inside of our palettes, almost all our APIs are built out of regular .gvi's on the web target. Uh, yeah. Right. So web target supports both GBI webs, which are HTML panel in the browser things, yeah. and not GBIs, which are normal desktop GBIs, but we can't execute it directly because the web browser does not interpret that dot GBI. But what we can do is inline that into the top level thing. And that top level thing is HTML and it knows how to execute. So, uh, so a regular a regular GBI can effectively execute job any JavaScript. Is that what you're a regular GBI can be called by a web VI. Yeah. Yeah, that diagram can be oh, I see. Uh, okay. injected you're into that. Like, it's kind of like compiled, right? Like it's, it's getting compiled into a bunch of JavaScript bytecode. This isn't like a free to get every feature in the desktop GBI. Like there's things like classes over there, which we don't know how to interpret in the JavaScript execution engine. If we're not like magical, we can't like look at the classes and be like, oh, now we know how to like build the JavaScript stuff out of that. So, well, so you can't, if in your package, you don't just export that log dot, that thing that was in the support folder, I don't know if you think you want to. Uh, yeah, that's that right. You could, but I'd say it's more of a best practice. It's better to have a, a little layer, and I'm going to write that layer right now so you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, in my support file, here's my, my log. Now I'm going to go ahead and make a, uh, for that. 
And I kind of want my clients to call, like, depending on this function that you get, I'm just going to rename it. Oh, like, log API. Sure. Um, yeah, so I can if I do it that way, basically what happens is anyone, uh, I can now package up my library and ship it to someone else. And when they use it, they're just gonna see this, this new log API thing I made. Uh, so let me like go on with the demo. So you're gonna export the log API as part of the game component? Right, and I'm not gonna export my like JavaScript thing. I don't really want to, it's like a detail, it's like an implementation detail. It's kind of like encapsulation. Like, I don't really care that my consumer there's two cents if I use JavaScript over there. Um, so I can like not expose that detail. I can only expose the DI. Can you use this library on the desktop and you know, rather than the JavaScript? Can you use uh, this library on desktop? We don't support running current the JavaScript stuff on the desktop, although that's something we could do if we were so compliant. <laughs> technology exists. We have the power. Alright. So here what I got. I exported my DI. I have my library component. Uh, I should be in good shape. Now, I don't need this application anymore. Uh, I want to show what it's like as a partner, how you would make a thing. Uh, so, I feel good about this. Now, how do I give it to someone else, right? Well, the answer that you know, we've been telling people is make a package. Uh, it's the easiest way to do that. Um, come in here, and my component, you can say create package or installer with my item. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And that generates some stuff for me. It says it's going to take my components, my library component, it's going to put it in the public add-ons folder. That's great, that's what I want. Uh, it has dependencies on stuff. That's kind of less great, because this is like JavaScript. I don't really have any dependencies, I don't really need this stuff. You can actually get rid of these if you want to. Uh, I'll leave them, it doesn't really hurt anything. Uh, you tell it you want a package or a package installer. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to make a package because I intend to put it on the package manager. The installer is fine too, but I don't really need that right now. Uh, and there's also a section here that's collapsed called feeds. Does anyone know what a feed is? Not that many. I'm going to not use justice. What's a feed? A feed is an easy way to distribute a package to people. It's going there. I'm not the package guy. Uh, what I can do as part of this is I can say, hey, you know, this package I'm making, add it to a feed. And it says, feed location. You need a pack. You need a pack. Okay, so you can just give it, uh, if you're working amongst a team, you can give it. Uh, uh, network location if you wanted to. In this case, I'm just going to make a, a folder on my C drive called feed. And I'll show you what it looks like when I'm consuming that. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of weird stuff I just covered, maybe. You know, a lot of physical cases uh, in the audience. I'm going to build it and see if that works. I'm right, building it. It completed. You say, what if this happens? What case? The build results. It made some things, but maybe more importantly, I'm really curious if something showed up in this. C feed folder, and like lo and behold, I now have a disk folder called feed and some stuff in it that I don't really. This is a repository on disk, right? Right, right. so I made a little bit of repository uh, in this case, and I thought I'd never share it you know, more widely available. Share it with your hard drive. Yeah, share it with my hard drive. Okay, so now great. So let's say I'm now a different person. I walk in, Darren, what did you build for me? I made this awesome login API. Yeah, well, that's super cool. I put it on the feed folder. I'm like, what? Okay, whatever. Um, well, let me open the package manager and see if I can get it. Uh, so I can go here. Uh, well, you know what? I just realized something I wanted to show before I get too far. I also want to show you you can make a palette for this stuff. Has anyone seen the palette editor before? Not seen it. Mm -hmm. Turning you can make your own palette. There's a button here called Create Palette File. And you can save it on a diagram palette. Uh, and it makes this thing called a GPAL. And you can open this, this document. And it helps you design what your user-facing palette is going to be. And you can do things like change the name of your, of your node uh, that's exposed to your palette, and you can uh, get rid of extra junk here. Um, you things if you wanted to change this. You'll also say, hey, I want this thing to show up in the atoms folder. Here's a way to define that and customize that if you want to. So uh, I'm going to shut off and I'll rebuild things here. Uh, my package, I'll rebuild it. Again, I'm just like adding this to a feed, so like if I rebuild it, no big deal. Or depending on the feed, it's going to get a newer version. So, okay, so I opened up Package Manager. I did it in a clean machine. I come here. Uh, how do I get awareness of the speed? I can check this magic box that says show the feed management tools, Package Manager. I go to this funny little tab, 
I can say add a B. Cool. So it's a pick a name. How about Darren Awesome B? And I'm going to give it a URL. In this case, I'm just going to give it a CD folder. And it's going to do some stuff. And there's some messages at the bottom. So it's thinking. Now, if I look in the packages tab, there is my log rib right there. It says category add ons. Cool. So let's install. Whoa. Okay, it's determining my license agreements. That's really important. <laughs> I got my progress bar to death. Thankfully, it's very fast. Um, fantastic. Okay, so it's now installed. And if I look in my installed list of stuff, somewhere in here is my log lib thing. Probably is it. Uh, yourself. It's probably all the food that you Yeah, there it is. Oh, right. Um, Whoa. Okay, did the restart take effect? Okay, sure, I'll restart it. I'm actually not 100% sure if I have to restart capture like new install things like this, but I'm going to do it to be sure. Um, I'm going to install it. Now, when I make a new web project, I should have a new add ons palette with my log. That's really what I was trying to say. That's what you want the consumer of your library to get. You want a really easy, basic value experience. And none of this web stuff I just had to go through, and none of this package stuff you said to do it was really a thing I had to think about. So when I make a new application, I come to my diagram, and I should see a new thing. I never gave it an icon. There's my log API. And I now expanded. Diagram my web VI and have logging, and I could have wire through that and make that work. So that was like lightning fast advanced stuff. I want to go to the really cool stuff though. So it's like if you have questions, we'll come back to it. Um, I want to get back more to the inspired parts. Um, just like I do lots of things, I'm going to cover the details here. There's specifics in the data types. Well, there's different JavaScript patterns you can support, even complicated stuff you might think we not support. Like async awaits and promises, we actually can do that. We can integrate with JavaScript that does those sorts of things. So, uh, it's promising there. To show you an example of one, I have a phone demo. So, if you want to open up your phone and type in bit.ly.slash webbi.puppy or just do your camera thing, uh, you can see uh, a webbi selfie machine that I made uh, last week. Uh, but we're going to angle like this. And uh, basically, what you'll see, uh, it's going to look all above you. I've loaded the system link cloud, as we showed earlier, and it asks you, like, hey, I need a file. Do you have a file on your phone you want to show? You can upload it this way. So a question is about files, how do I get files up here? <laughs> Using this puppy library uh, that we were playing with, I can actually upload either things from the camera, the picture I take, or a file that's happening out on my device. So it'll be the local device, whatever that device is, it could be the web browser, uh, my desktop machine, or my Mac, or my phone, or whatever. You said something about upload. You mean it's loading it into the browser? It's taking it from the device and sending it to the browser instance. So it's not going to a server anywhere. Right? It's literally just like being sent up to the browser. Yeah, so I can do a camera shot. And you can tell you want to open that thing, and now I've got a web guy with my dumb face stuck on it. Um, if you do this, it could be your dumb face or whatever you want. And then that's the about way to get it to system link, right? Now that's one way to do it. This is going straight to the browser. And there's a way to get a system link as well. Uh, we don't have an upload the system link from WebVI. Just download. We can download the system link from WebVI. I'm going to demo that also. Okay. For that matter, you can also download files from the WebVI arbitrarily. And it does on my next page. So we're happy with this one. The next one. First, before I go on to the download bit, how does this work? Uh, this is an example of what I hope people in the community want to build. It's like we built this thing just in house to up you wrapper libraries. And we want people to like have a palette full of these sorts of nodes and they just drop them and use them. And in fact, there's an API library back there with JavaScript, it's a detail no one cares about. Uh, they just want to see this cool capability in our app. So, this is what I hope people want to go build. And uh, I'll show you uh, the download uh, the download story now. So, I already built the project, there's lots of coding involved in this one. Um, and what I'm going to do with this project is I'm going to there's a System link server on this machine that I'm demoing, and it's got a TDS file already uploaded to the system link. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a web API that pulls the TDMS file down into the browser. And then my web API, uh, what it will do is it will allow the browser uh, instance to download that as a file to a local device. I'm doing two layers of downloading here. Pretty, pretty neat. Uh, I'll show you what the code looks like. a bunch of the system link API calls, much like Rita shared earlier, open rewrite those kinds of things. In this case, though, I'm opening a link to the server, and I'm trying to look for files that have a temp in it, and then I'm filtering that down, and then grabbing some elements of the waveform, and I'm putting the waveform there. Like, pretty basic UI. Uh, and then what I'm doing is I'm taking the waveform out of there, and I'm breaking it apart, and I'm stringing by it. Now I'm going to let the user download this as just a JSON file. So, when you say download it as a JSON file, you're saying it's like to save the JSON file from my browser client to my local hard drive? Right. I'll show you what it looks like. If I run this WebDI in my browser, right, it's going to go talk to the NI web server, locate that data, so that it pulls back the data set just fine. And you notice there I have this raw data JSON file, and this is just the stringified version of that waveform. So that saved into my downloads folder. Yeah, this is just normal. Uh, yeah, this is wherever it is. You can see downloads somewhere. Uh, that's the next file. Yeah, there's my raw data file. So I was demoing like this a few times. Uh, so you can see here, this is a three node demo. And it's crazy. You just, like, you just talk to a web server, you pull down a bunch of TDMS measurement data, and then you're downloading it and doing whatever you want with it. Uh, so you can imagine building some sort of like, you know, instead of this like you know, manufactured demo of a random waveform, it's like months of test data on some test line, and you're now like using WebGI to explore all that test data, find some cool phenomenon that you're trying to zone in on, and then you can download that specific data record or something that you can even hand off to someone. So those are the kinds of apps that we want to get people building, and this depends on our NXT 4 stuff, that we have a lot of waveform uh, and the file reading capability. Uh, the file download actually you can do with JSLI now or in any room. Uh, so. Okay, questions? But, so, just so I have this clear, the graph side of the thing that's happening here, that's all in memory, essentially, on the client. Correct. And then just as an additional, somewhat unrelated thing, you're saving to a file on the local device. Correct. Okay. Second, that's not actually valid JSON, is it? Uh, so I didn't write it with other. The real question that I have is yeah. there's, there's no JSON, there's no like real JSON parsing and, and generating type libraries that exist yet. Thank you. Do that? Okay. There are many ways to make things in the JSON. So if you're going to use built in JSON stuff, there are well, some ways. I want to do it in HTML VS. Yes, in, in the web module, you can use JSON. Yeah, so this node. Okay. Uh, but it, yeah, okay. you just added some stuff to it. Gotcha. Yeah, so I put some header stuff on there, which made it look kind of not disagreeing. I guess I put the time stamp in the DT, so I was trying to be complete. Yeah, right. Um, so, my high level question is how mobile friendly this is. <laughs> Specifically, it's things like uh, resilient to moving on and off the Wi Fi and data plans being conservative on data plans. Right, so it's pretty much amazing at all things in all situations. All your life. It's a device that has a browser that we've built in the last couple of years. It's probably going to work. It doesn't require plugins. Now, in terms of that battery usage, if you run a web it's just like a tight you know, some calculation, it's going to run your battery down. Uh, we also do have some things, uh, though, to mitigate against like lost Wi Fi. So our event structure on the web API has an online offline event. So if you have the device open and you walk into a Wi-Fi dead zone and you're trying to do a bunch of stuff, then it doesn't, you don't want to waste battery when you're like, you know, not having like, an active connection. You basically have an event that flies in your diagram and you can respond to that in your code. Uh, so it's kind of like up to you to provide that like 
actually get battery life uh, death. But is, we do use some rudimentary tools, I'm sure we can do better. Um, if it becomes something we hear feedback on, I think we'll go even further. But so far, we have got you know, feedback and you know, additional work on that front here. Awesome in all places, anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about JavaScript library interface. For Fido, we got some even cooler stuff in the works where this is a little chunk of JavaScript. It builds up a little object. It has a string called CRU and a tested flag that says true in it. Wouldn't it be cool if you could drop a node that returns a reference to that JavaScript object and pass it around? Yeah. Um, so we're going to let you do that in the Fido version. We do everything really right. In this example, we have a, one function that builds up the object, one that returns just the device name from the object, and one that returns the flag. And we build up a little uh, example here that will pull out the flag and say, is it fetch yes or not? Call the device name, it's CRIO. And when we run this thing, uh, it will populate the device name. When you say object, you're talking about like JSON data structure. Yeah, it's actually a, a JavaScript object in the JavaScript execution system. So, LabVIEW is not going to do anything with that object. It's just a reference to pass around to other JavaScript calls. But it turns out that if you want to do things like have a jQuery control, this is a really helpful thing that cleans up your code. Yeah. If you're not having to build some kind of weird like object manager uh, in the JavaScript side, and you know, you're know not equipped to be a JavaScript writer. Right. Well, and so I, I'm also not like an object oriented JavaScript programmer. So it, it's basically a reference to a static data structure. To, a lot of it looks like it, it would be like a cluster of data, and I'm accessing elements of that binary. Uh, more or less, I don't think it's static, it's pretty dynamic. Meaning it can change, right? Yes. It's by reference. People can add to it. Well, it's, it's like a variant attribute table. Yeah, it's a variant attribute table. It's like, I mean, it's just a data structure. Yeah, right. It is but it has, it's not active because it has events. So right. you can have things like functions in there. It's kind of a, you can have functions that yeah. execute and stuff. It's yeah. okay yeah. from the diagram. Right. It's like, yeah, but from like the diagram, you have to strip the type as far as you can go. Yeah, yeah. it's super easy. Yeah. 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 Hmm. You're right. I just said on the diagram, it's okay. You can't do anything with it in G except pass it between your reference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so if you had a third party library that passed up some weird <laughs> data type that was. Yeah. Mega JavaScript, and, and you had another call that needed that data type. You essentially have a wire that lets you connect those two things. Correct. And instead of having to figure out how to dump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. But I'm going to have to write that JavaScript kind of wrapper to, to make that happen, or will I be able to just kind of get it straight from the from the third party library? It's going to be a case by case by basis. There may be you have to write a little wrapper. Like, in, in 3.1 and earlier, you're almost certainly going to have to write the wrapper. After we get this technology, I think the odds go up a little higher than you don't have to write a wrapper. It really depends on exactly what you're trying to wrap. Okay. All right. I want to talk a ton about the diagram. Yeah, can we get to the DOM anyway? Let's talk about, let's talk about it. You can get the DOM with this somehow. I've never tried to do this. I can't speak with great authority on the metrics. Uh, I need to pull back. Right, I'll talk about that. Okay. So, and I mean, I showed this kind of makeover edition to show where I took this VI on the left that I wrote, and I used a CSS styling to build the thing on the right. Hopefully, you agree that it objectively it is better. Um, at least it has more color. And it has more purple. Um, this is also built this, the, uh, with the XY positioning, the absolute layout, and I use the relative layout for if you have an iPad and you rotate it in the phone, and like, it actually looks decent. And you use you know, style fonts and that sort of thing. How hard is it the vertical center? The vertically center, uh, it is okay most of the time. <laughs> there are some rules. If you ever build a website with Wix.com, you're actually left with a lot of the same restrictions. So that's one kind of question with Wix test. Like, I'm sure I'm not going to lay out to you. Um, how do I do this? How did I get this like result on the right? Well, one, there's like kind of a three step process. The easiest thing to do, when you mentioned, look at the config things. You can do a lot of things. In this VI, I colored everything pink that I could do in the real. Uh, it was really uh, close to what I wanted. We changed uh, colors of bar graphs and, and, and graph views and things like that. Uh, if that's not there, look to the diagram. We have property notes now. We didn't have it at first. Now we have a fairly rich set of property notes we can develop. If there's things you want to do that aren't in the, in the configuration game, like disabling control, you do them programmatically. That's a great thing to do. That's a lot of way, right? 
What did he do if he does it over? I can't find the thing I need. I need to uh, rotate my text and give it a, a, a drop shadow. So how do you go about doing that? Doing something like that. I'll tell you how to do it. Uh, so if I, in this case, I have a text control a screen uh, indicator uh, called machine. And uh, the way I would go about this is in my project, I add a CSS file. Uh, as data style sheets, uh, you can make a pretty simple uh, CSS file. In this case, I'm defining a, a class of controls called NIV dash text. You put a theory in the front, that's the really important part. You get this. Uh, and I give it a style. In this case, we have a set of styles uh, that we have documented, and I'll show you where they're documented later. Uh, it's so that apply generally to a lot of broad set of controls. In this case, the border. Let's say I don't want the border on my string indicator. I'd like to take off with this style. How do I apply this style? Well, first you have to tell the web BI that this thing even exists. Because there's something in the project that's not quite good enough. You have to go to the web BI, add a little link tag, and say, link my CSS file into my web BI. If you're successful with that, you go to the uh, indicator you want to style, you select it, and you go into the configuration chain for that uh, indicator, and you can set a class attribute. In this case, this is where I type, and I reach that text. That's how. Uh, glad you know to like link up this style with that specific control. And then, you, know, you can put that same class on a whole bunch of controls if you want to move the border for a bunch of things. It makes it really easy and powerful to do that. Uh, so in this case, the result is I get this thing. Okay, cool, no border, right? Well, if you want to move borders for things, yeah, this is a fantastic tool. There's a lot of other things you might want to do. Um, you have multiple attributes? Yeah, multiple attributes. You actually can have multiple attributes. So. Here I just did one NIV dash text, I get an NIV dash uh, order, I get an NIV dash background. Is that like a comma separated there? Oh, separated. It's space separated in this case. Uh, space separated lives however many classes you want. So you can kind of build up a more complicated hierarchy for styling. You can reuse that attribute on other things too, so you can batch with the same style. But cool. Yeah, and Feedback we've gotten is that, hey, that's great power you give us. What the heck are the styles that we can use, right? It's like, what is my palette issues from? We don't have an editor for this. So, what we've done is, uh, since we've gotten that feedback, uh, the shortest term thing we can do to help is we made a guide. Uh, and I post this on GitHub. I have a link to it there. I have a link again at the end. Uh, and the kind of things that find that page are uh, rules like this. You can set a user class name for your control, and that's how you change the border. The color. Uh, if you want to put rounded corners on your button, you use this rule. If you want to uh, change the hover color, uh, do things of that nature. Basically, anything we got a request about, we figured out in house how to do it and we put it on this page. Now, there's one caveat with this page, and it's disclaimered all over the heck of this place. So if you look at the page, it basically says, release to release, this may break. Because <laughs> we don't want to be bound by this uh, for all time. Uh, but I also didn't want to like tie your hands, so I'll make sure you had access to the properties you need in that given version. So our commitment is to update this page every shipping version, so you know if something has changed. Let's get a document written down somewhere. But just because you use a style like this doesn't mean you're not going to be up for a slight headache when you go to upgrade the feature version of the module. You might have to go take a look at your styles and tweak them. Five minutes. Yeah. I noticed that. Uh, like uh, but the one in the middle in the previous slide is like the regular CSS, but the other ones are like NI defined properly. Yeah, so we have a mix. Uh, I think the idea is that we want to call the NI defined eventually, so we have a job there. Yeah, so we don't want you to get too married. Yeah. So. I want to show you also the power of this. We get a third party control. In this case, we're using a, a really uh, rich and free charting library called eCharts. And uh, we just uh, pop it up, and what you'll really notice about this when you pull it up is it's got a 3D graph on there, and it is super responsive and fast. And we don't have a 3D graph in a lot of your web guys yet. Yet, you are looking at one on the web guy. This is the power of this extension that I'm talking about. And it's really what we want to unlock for you guys. Uh, here are woes. I think someone saw it. That's good. <laughs> It's also responsive, so if you change your bone direction, you should see a relay out in a healthy way. So this is all executing browser side. Pretty awesome. Okay, there you go. Alright. Alright, we're gonna go on time. 
Does everyone see the code? I'm going to just quickly fly through the last part here. We are doing something in Biomo to make integrating third party control even better. We're giving you a placeholder box and it lets you stick your own third party thing in there on the panel. Right now, you have to go to the HTML tech stuff and, and add these custom things. We're going to make it a little more like, at least you can size an area and place it somewhere and say, I'm going to fill this in later with programmatic stuff. But we're going to add that. We're pretty excited about that as well. Look out for it. All right. Last thing to hopefully inspire you guys. It's really cool that we do all stuff in a browser. Well, the maybe interesting thing is we're, we're generating JavaScript. You can actually do, put, make your web APIs run in all sorts of bizarre places. You can make Excel plugins. You can make server side web services. If you want to make a web service in a web API, you can. Bizarre, you can use Node.js to load your web API and run it on the server side. You can build up a web service out of this stuff. You can also make Facebook apps if you wanted to. You want to make a browser extension? Hell yeah. In this case, you have a graph. And if you're running as a browser extension, you have uh, extra permissions that the browser doesn't normally give you. You can access files and stuff like that directly from the browser. The possibilities are really endless. And I, I think you should think about this. You want to build awesome things like Chromecast libraries, Chromecast and TVs, I think you totally should. And we're going to have a way to put them in the store. I hope you're excited by this and want to do this with me. And uh, here's a bunch of links uh, to help you learn more. Take a picture of that. Thank you for your attention.